Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for our second of five 2020 Invasive Lunch webinars as part of California Invasive Species Action Week. My name is Doug Johnson, and I'll be one of your hosts today. This uh, series of webinars is co-hosted by the University of California Department of Agriculture and Natural Resources and the California Invasive Plant Council. Um, quick look at today's uh, uh, moderators, uh, myself, Doug Johnson, and Yuta Berger from the California Invasive Plant Council and Sabrina Drill from UCANR. Um, you guys want to say hello quickly? Hello. Hello there. Thanks. Sabrina, you want to say a little bit about uh, UCANR? Sure, yeah. So we're the University of California Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. We run the cooperative extension offices in every county in California um, and also have researchers and specialists on several of the UC campuses. Um, and we run the 4-H program, Master Gardeners, California Naturalists, um, as well as the Integrated Pest Management Program. Um, I'm the Natural Resources Advisor for Los Angeles and Ventura counties and I just wanna welcome everybody today. I'll be moderating the chat box, which should be used for any um, technical questions or difficulties that you're having. Let me know and I'll try to try to fix them. Excellent. Thanks so much, Sabrina. Um, and the California Invasive Plant Council is a nonprofit organization working to protect California's environment and economy from invasive plants. Um, I will be uh, running the Zoom and Yuta, my coworker, our science program director, will be um, uh, staffing the question and answer line. Um, so Calypsy and UCANR have ho um, hosted this webinar series for the last two years as a way of bringing some of the latest science and practice to the public. We really appreciate you joining us today to learn more about invasive species. It's one of the world's top environmental problems damaging biodiversity and natural resources that we depend on. Before we get started, a couple of uh, webinar tips. Um, starting on the top left there, uh, you can hit the escape key if you find yourself in full screen mode and you don't know how to get back to the rest of your computer, hit the escape key. Um, you may find that the box uh, with our small pictures on it um, hovering at the Doug, I think don't have... you lost your audio for a second. I'm sorry. Uh, we're... Yeah, Doug, we're having a, a little bit of problem hearing you. I'm going to step in if that's okay. okay. Then, yeah, so okay um, yes, you were going in and out a bit. I'm sorry. Well, just interrupt me again if it happens and okay. you know what goes with this slide. <laughs> Um, the box of uh, profile pictures on the right can be moved if it's in your way. And at the bottom, you may have fewer choices than what I have, but you will have a Q&A section and a chat section, and you will see this toolbar if you hover near the bottom of your screen. And as Sabrina mentioned, the Q&A section is where you can ask a question about the content of the, of the webinar. And the chat is where you can leave a comment if you need assistance uh, with audio or video or anything else. Um, note that these webinars will be recorded and posted online for future viewing. Um, and uh, we do have a quick survey afterwards so you can give us your perspective on what went well and things that could go better. Um, a reminder, we have them each day this week. Uh, we had a great one on Play Clean Go, how to not move invasive species around when you're recreating yesterday. Uh, tomorrow is using eDNA to find invasive species. On Thursday, Sabrina will be talking about restoring urban waterways. And on Friday, we'll have a talk on Phytophthora soil pathogens that cause sudden oak death and other problems. All of these can be found by Googling invasive lunch and there you'll find a place to register for each day's webinar, um, as well as see recorded talks from this year and two previous years. So three quick polls that I want to run by you so we can um, find out a little bit about who's 
with us today. So this first one asks, how familiar are you with the invasive species issue? Is it something that you're brand new to, not very familiar, or is it something that you're extremely familiar with, maybe too familiar with? I'll give it another five seconds and then end the polling and show you the results. All right. So it looks like we have a lot of a lot of folks. About 60% um, of the folks are already familiar with invasive species, um, but the other 40 aren't, and that is great. We are really trying to um, help um, educate Californians and others about the impact of invasive species. All right. Take a look at the second one. I want to find out where people are calling in from. Um, mostly California, I would imagine, um, but other states outside of California or from Mexico or other countries outside of US and Mexico. Okay, gonna end the polling on this and share the results. So you can see we do have 70% uh, of folks from California, but quite a few from Mexico and um, some from other states outside of California and some outside of US and Mexico as well. And finally, uh, Relaunch polling. And while Doug is doing that, I just want to make a plea to please take these polls and then the survey you're going to receive at the end. It really helps us um, know if we're on the right track, improve the series in future years, and also sort of justify our time doing these. So it would be very much appreciated. Thank you. All right, last but not least, do you have a dog? <laughs> All right. Let's end that and take a look. Well, it looks like the, the largest group is, of course, I've got a dog. So um, that's one of the exciting things about today's webinar is um, we get to educate ourselves about particular invasive species and in some beautiful locations um, and working with man's best friend at the same time. All right. So um, without further ado, um, I'm going to let Yuta, um, who has visited um, some of the islands off Baja California and worked with um, Luciana and folks from Conservacion, Conservacion de Islas um, to introduce our speakers today. Thanks, Doug. Well, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Miriam Batowski and uh, Luciana Luna from the Grupo de Geología y Conservación de Islas, or otherwise known as HESI, if you hear that uh, acronym, that's what it stands for. This is a wonderful nonprofit organization based out of Mexico that focuses on conservation of the um, islands uh, in, uh, uh, out of the co uh, coast of Mexico that really uh, hold so much biodiversity. And Miriam, our first speaker, Miriam Latowski, is the Director of Development at HESI, and she has a master's degree in environmental sciences. She helps lead HESI's island biosecurity program to prevent the introduction of exotic invasive species. She also, she uh, wears many hats. She also specializes and oversees the environmental education and communications for the organization. Our second speaker, Dr. Luciana Luna Mendoza is the Director of Ecology at HESI. 
and she has been working on conservation issues in uh, specifically on Guadalupe Island, a remote protected Mexican island off of the coast of Baja California since 2002. She specialized on feral cats and house mice, two problem species on the island for her PhD. And she received that in, uh, at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. Since then, she has been involved in all aspects of restoration and conservation on Guadalupe Island, including plants, animals, and pretty much everything <laughs> that the island has to offer. So without further ado, um, Miriam, take it away. All right, Miriam, I've stopped sharing um, and you can share your PowerPoint. Excellent, I can see it, although not in slide mode yet. And we also have an, a request um, when you're presenting, if you can start your video. And, oh, there you are, Miriam. Yeah. Well, um, hi everyone, and thank you for joining, joining us uh, while we talk about how much we love our conservation dogs and how they work to protect the islands in Mexico and keep them free of invasive mammals. Um, as we've already been presented, uh, Luciana and I work at the Grupo de Ecología y Conservación de Islas. We are an NGO um, and we work on the comprehensive restoration of um, island ecosystems. And I would like to invite you to follow us on social media. You can find us as at Islas Gesi. Uh, the work that we are gonna present is the result of a very wide array of collaboration. And without all of these uh, partners, we couldn't uh, do everything that we are doing for the Mexican biodiversity. So we thank all of them. And first of all, I would like to say, so why do we devote ourselves to islands and uh, why do they need protection? So islands hold a disproportionate amount of biodiversity. They are hotspots for it. And this is because they are um, ev uh, evolutionary laboratories. So they have very, uh, a, a wide array of endemic species. It's the same um, in Mexico. We have around 4,000 islands and they host nine times more endemic species per surface unit than the continental counterpart. So we have 3% of all uh, Mexican endemic species on the islands. Um, but they are also uh, very uh, fragile and vulnerable. And they provide us with uh, so many ecosystem uh, services. And they are stepping stones for migratory birds. And they tr transcend borders. And they um, provide us with uh, benefits uh, that are not only um, for the ecosystem and, and climate change, but also for the economy. But as I told you, they are very fragile and vulnerable. And in Mexico, of all the documented extinctions, uh, we have 24 terrestrial vertebrates that have gone extinct in Mexico, 21 of them are island endemic species, and 17 has been caused by invasive mammals, particularly uh, harmful are rodents and cats, feral cats. So this means 76% of all extinctions in Mexico have been caused by invasive alien species. So uh, most of you are familiar, but I'm just gonna very quickly give you the, the uh, the description. So these are organisms that are, have been transported outside their original distribution area and they have they are able to establish their population and grow and they affect the ecosystems but also public health and the economy. And as you can see on the drawings in the bottom, 
there are many ways in which uh, humans can transport many times unknowingly uh, these invasive species. And the IUCN has this list of the 100 most harmful invasive species, and 46 of them are already established in Mexico. And what we are trying to do is to prevent their introduction to the Mexican islands, uh, which are so important to us. Um, so many of these you uh, probably know, and this talk is gonna be particularly centered on rodents because they are some of the most uh, harmful species. They are fierce predators. They also compete for resources and they spread uh, diseases and they not only harm the wildlife and uh, ecosystem, but also have impacts on the economy and public health. Luckily, these uh, invasive species can be managed and uh, the talk today is gonna be centered on biosecur biosecurity. So how do we proactively guard the islands from the establishment of alien species and this is, uh, there are many ways like that um, top drawing and as we heard on yesterday's talk, which was uh, very good, uh, there are many ways in, we, in which we can do this and conservation dogs are one of them. And then the next is the eradication. That means the complete removal of an entire population from a determined area, for example, an island. These are pretty complex uh, projects and they take a lot of, of research and uh, um, a huge investment. So it's better to prevent than to eradicate. And the, the last uh, preferable um, management is control. So that, that means just keeping the population under a threshold where negative impacts are considered tolerable, but you're going to have to do it all the time. So um, it's, it also means uh, that you have to invest a lot of, of time, effort, um, people, and money. So Mexico has a 20-year trajectory on island restoration. And as you can see on the green circles, we've done 60 eradications of 13 species of invasive mammals on 39 islands. Out of these 16 have been eradications of rodents, mostly black rats. And so this is what we are trying to protect. We want these little green circles to continue green and of course, we also want the islands that have never had any invasive species to continue like that. So these uh, eradication projects have uh, proven to be highly beneficial. At least 206 endemic species in Mexico have benefited from these um, eradications and we have documented them on, on many cases and particularly for the red-billed tropic bird. I hope you can see my, my cursor moving on it. Um, this, this beautiful um, bird. Um, after we did the black rat eradication on San Pedro Martir and Parayón de San Ignacio Islands in the Gulf of California, uh, it had a, a dramatic impact on, on the reproductive success. So um, the, the chicks and the eggs were being predated by black rats. And after removing them, we saw uh, so many more chicks uh, grow up to become adult red-billed red tropic birds. And that was amazing and inspiring and, and um, made us want to do much more. So another uh, work that we do is on restoring seabird colonies. These are um, seabirds that had been extirpated from the islands. This means they stopped nesting on an island because the invasive mammals were decimating the population, so they decide to go elsewhere. Um, 
Thankfully, now 80% of these uh, colonies have been restored after uh, removing the invasive mammals. So this is something that we really want to protect. And these benefits, um, one third of seabird species worldwide, because here in the, in the Mexican Pacific, one third of all known seabird species in the world nest on our islands. So uh, we are very proud of it. And we know we have to work to keep the islands uh, free of invasive mammals. And that's where uh, dogs like Merlina come in. So what's next after doing an, an eradication project? So we have to uh, change the way that we move ourselves around the islands. As you can see, this is a very old picture from San Benito Oeste. And whenever uh, fishermen, fishermen came to start the fishing season, they would bring everything with them. And they knew that uh, a, a rodent had come in a mattress, for example. No? So that's what we need to change. Uh, we have to become proactive and know these very simple uh, measures that we need to take to avoid uh, a new introduction. And rodents are particularly important because with just one couple of rodents or one pregnant female uh, rat that comes into an island, in one year we're gonna have 5,000 rats. So, I mean, whenever I, I think about why do we need to inspect everything and clean everything, and, and follow all these measures, I just remember this one little fact and I know why it's so important. So what is island biosecurity? It's just the measures that we take to prevent um, new introductions into island ecosystem. And it has three components, which is prevention, the most important ones, one, and then the early detection, we wanna know whenever just one organism comes into the island so that we have a rapid response and we can um, stop the, the species from establishing on the island. So we, a few years ago, six years ago, we started this project with the, um, GEF Global Environment Fund, and together with um, the National Commission for the Knowledge and Use of Biodiversity, CONADIO in Mexico, and the National Commission for Protected Areas, CONAN, to strengthen Mexico's capacities to manage invasive alien species uh, through the implementation of our national strategy. So this meant working a lot on biosecurity and eradication on islands. So we, as an NGO, worked as a hinge between uh, the government authorities and local communities to create um, a biosecurity culture in the Mexican islands. So we did this through uh, an, our national uh, island biosecurity program. We decided on a bottom-up approach because um, no one likes to be told what to do. So we decided that we needed to uh, involve the communities from the very beginning, uh, first of all, by raising awareness on what invasive species are and the, and the impacts that they have on wildlife and every other aspect of, of ecosystems um, in order to um, implement these um, protocols. So we started by uh, raising awareness and we did this uh, mostly through play. We love to play uh, with kids, but also with adults. And we also like to involve the arts. So we have now songs about the biodiversity of the islands. We have um, some, some plays, as you can see, we have here our, our cat and, and rat that are the villains of our play. And we just want to create this identity and not create but foster the identity so that people 
uh, value and care for the islands and want to participate in implementing uh, the, the preventive measures. And then we, we also um, wanted to formulate uh, island biosecurity protocols that were specific to each island, their, the use, the stakeholders, um, the, the very specific scenarios of each island. So we hold, uh, we've held around 60 workshops with many different stakeholders from local authorities to communities where we just wanted to know what activities were being done on the islands. For example, if it's uh, tourism or research or commercial activities, um, and then to understand how people move to the islands so that we have our critical control points. And this is important because that's how we know, for example, where Merlina, our conservation dog, has to work uh, to prevent the spread of invasive species uh, toward the most islands. And then of course we have to build uh, capacities. So we've also done some, um, well, many workshops with um, local communities. We establish these uh, biosecurity committees that are gonna um, continue with the biosecurity uh, culture and the implementation of biosecurity protocols with a long-term vision because uh, this is something that never stops. We always have to be vigilant of our islands and our, our natural ecosystems. So we teach them how to prevent but also how to early detect any invasive species and as you can see, we, we do this with the, for example, the tourist service providers or park rangers or the Navy officers that are uh, on some islands. And we now have um, biosecurity officers um, for some of the islands who do the inspections before people come into the island. We also work on communication and we have um, designed this um, signage, for example. And what we are trying here is to have a brand, just like we saw yesterday, yesterday with the Play Clean Go. Uh, we are trying to create this image and this brand for island biosecurity in Mexico so that whenever people see these, they're always blue with these yellow stripes that they know, oh, this is what I have to watch out for. And in this island, uh, these are the measures that I have to take to um, be a part of, of the um, conservation of the island. And now I'm gonna um, give the word to Luciana, my colleague, and she's gonna tell us more about our conservation box. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, I want to thank very much to the organizer. Thanks to all of you for being here assisting the seminar. We are thrilled to be part of this uh, webinar, a series of, of webinars about invasive species. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk to you about the. Luciana, I apologize for interrupting you. Um, you're very yeah. muffled. Can you try adjusting your microphone? Okay, the, the volume? Yeah, or maybe even physically moving it closer to your mouth. Is that better? It's a little bit better. Better? Somewhat better. Better. Uh, much better or? A little better, and it could be um, my internet, your internet, or Doug's internet. <laughs> So let's keep okay. going. Or Maria, Maria's internet, which is uh, uh, yeah, it's a computer. And Mariam computer and oh, perfect. perfect. Let me just try something very quick. Oh, you sound great now, Luciana. Is that better? Oh, yes. awesome! Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so well, thank you uh, all, and 
Well, I'm going to focus about how we use uh, the detection dogs to use them for prevention and early detection, two of the biosecurity phases that Mariam talked about. Well, many, as we uh, know, many of these species are very, dif are very difficult to detect and to stop in, in, in consequence. So we use whatever tool we have available. And, and dogs, they turn out to be a great tool that have been using for decades for several things. Especially now in some countries, for example, in the USA, in Australia, in New Zealand, and the UK, they have big programs and uh, detector dog teams to check uh, baggage, cargo, and mail, all this international searching for illegal items or firearms or uh, narcotics, and, but very, very focused as well in biosecurity risks. This is animal-based products and fruits. And they search for a whole range of invasive alien species, which are weeds, snails, and mussels, fish, uh, weevils, even some, um, uh, they can detect the, the smell of a bacterial or fungal infection. So they're great, they're a great, great tool. Well, you name it. And in Mexico, we started use, uh, using them uh, around 1970s to detect especially agricultural quarantine items. And as many countries, they have more advance in this uh, and the, the use of detection dogs for conservation purposes. But in Mexico, uh, we are kind of just starting. Marian, please, she's going to be helping me with the slides. So uh, Senacica is uh, the guys that has a canine unit in Mexico. Uh, Senacica is a national health service, food safety and food quality, which in turn is part of the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development. Their main goal is to prevent the introduction of pests that affect uh, Mexican agro-industry. They, they have a lot of units, uh, 110, which per annum they check more than 2 million baggage and more than 250,000 commercial cargo. And in turn, per annum they detect around 100 ton of product that are considered a risk for this industry. So here in the picture in the right, you can see a unit inspecting bags from tourists arriving on cruise ships to Cozumel Island. Cozumel is an island that is located in the southeast of Mexico in the Caribbean. And there are a lot of cruise ships that arrive uh, each year to that site. So it's very, very considered a high risk because something that enters to Cozumel can actually go straight ahead to the continent um, afterwards. So, uh, in terms of using dogs for conservation, it's uh, fairly new and also, well, using them for the specific purpose of protecting the biodiversity on, on islands is even, um, well, uh, less, uh, it was less done in, in the country. So, we approach uh, a professional trainer, the veterinarian Mauricio Canales. He has a lot of experience training dogs for narcotics, explosives, search and rescue, and guard. So, in 2014, um, we approach him to, or him to train a dog for, for us for looking for invasive species. Now we are very good friends and he actually confessed to us that the first contact he was like, he, he thought it was a little bit odd to be training a species for this purpose. But now he fully understands. Since 2015, he has been visiting the islands and the ports, traveling in the Navy ships to work with us on islands. So he understands all this logic behind protecting the biodiversity and, and special places uh, as islands. So he, he takes all that knowledge and implemented and ad adapted all that logic uh, for the training. He has trained dogs for us to detect uh, um, native owl and also invasive species. So, okay, so we have a detection dog and now what we do with it. So there's some challenges behind to create a successful uh, canine unit. There's, uh, well, you need to have a, a dog handle that is committed to the purpose. David Cosillo, which works in, in, in Hesi, started as a handler in 2015, trained by Mauricio. Right now he's in charge of all the detection dogs that we have. It's a never ending process, not for the handler or the dog. As I said before, to have a successful canine unit, you need to have a deep link between the handler and the dog. So the handler, by one hand, needs to trust and read the dog signals or alerts accurately. And also the dogs need to trust and be willing to work with uh, the handler. They get excited, after all, 
it's a, it's a good uh, a game for them. So it's just to have this combination and they, they work well together. And also it's challenging because it's a big investment in the medium, the long term. You need to have dedicated staff to it, uh, good facilities, of course, the healthcare, training, reinforcement, once in a while with a trainer, and also to have all the travel expenses covered. Because it's very good to have uh, Merlina, which is the, the, the biosecurity dog that we have here in the picture. Um, and we have it in Ensenada, but it, it's great since we have this tool to be able to move the canine unit around in the country. But that, of course, we need to to allocate resources for that. So how do we um, use it to apply the security in the Pacific Mexican islands? So we're working, as Maria already mentioned before, we have a close collaboration with different entities, uh, including especially the federal government. So we work in close collaboration with the Mexican Navy and the Natural Protected Areas Commission, which is CONAM. And we have this uh, set up on a regular basis. And in Senada, uh, there's a second Nava region, which has the partners every month to Guadalupe Island and send the ships there. And also with the six, uh, sixth naval region, we have, which has the partners every month to the Vigilar Archipelago, where we find Socorro and Clarion Islands. Both islands are rat free and we want to keep them that way. Well, this only as a quick location. Uh, here is Ensenada up in the south. So the Navy ships depart from here all the way to Guadalupe and going south. Here is Manzanillo, which the boat or the ship departs to Revigedo National Park. So, uh, well, it's, it's great to have this close collaboration with the Navy because they actually uh, give the, this unit, uh, the canine unit to access to the full, um, the whole ship. So they, check not only the cargo section, but also the kitchen or the machinery section with uh, a road and can hide. So that's, that's great. And also, and as we have this close collaboration with the CONAM personnel, sometimes they go with us. So this is the case of the picture in the right. Uh, Alejandro Gonzalez, which is the director of the Revigedo National Park, uh, in that occasion went uh, with us just to see how the, the work was uh, working and trying actually to, uh, from that time setting up in, trying to set up in place um, um, future collaborations for the same purpose. So how this works, uh, uh, Merlina is triggered this behavior searching by a verbal command. So in this case is search or uh, busca in Spanish. And as I mentioned before, this is a game for her. So it will be involved. So she's getting excited and she's, she's trying to find something because she knows that if she does, she's going to get a positive reinforcement, which is a Kong, a toy. And she will get crazy about the Kong. And she will signal as a passive alert, which is sitting or laying down opposite to an active alert, which will be barking or scratching. So here in the, in the right in this picture, we see that she smells something in this box and in that turn, well, the handler will open the box and check that everything is fine. And in that occasion, it turns out there was a contaminated cardboard, uh, cardboard box because it was a secondhand use, but everything was, was fine. And well, also after, uh, if it's possible, after uh, Melina, Merlina alerts about something, it will be followed by double check with wax blocks, which is here in the, in the picture on the right, and traps. So uh, we, we deploy those devices anyways, but once the Merlina finds something, we check, of course, and, and that uh, um, precise um, time, but also we leave uh, some devices around. So yeah, she's very keen, very agile. She just jumps. You, you, don't, you don't actually have to ask her. She, will, she knows that she needs to check everything, so she will just jump and come around and, and do a, a great job. Sometimes it, it takes a long time, it's a big ship, you need to have breaks in between, but she's, she's just great. And in the right, and sometimes we have the opportunity to check as well the baggage of the people that is getting to the ship. And, and it's great because you get the opportunity to explain the people about biosecurity and all the, divers, the biodiversity on the islands that we're trying to take care of. And it, it's great, it, it serves for several purposes. So the results of uh, some of this uh, all uh, the devices deploy as well of the work with Merlina. 
In October in the last year, uh, Navy personnel informed took a number into, into us that a rat was caught in a ship. Immediately, we went together and we deployed several types of devices, traps, wax blocks, and bait stations, and also Marlena inspected all ships. Uh, she was only uh, found, um, she only found contaminated cardboard boxes. And after that, we, well, probably it was in the same ship as the, you know, where the rat was caught. So at, at the end, we decided that the, the ships were, uh, after several days of checking, were free to go to, in this case, to Guadalupe Island. So this was the case of a detection that was successful before actually the intruder getting to, to the island, which we are not always uh, that lucky. So this is the case of Natividad Island. Uh, that is located just in front of Guerrero, of Guerrero Negro, is a part of uh, the Vizcaino Biosphere Reserve. And in there, there's sufficient community that have been living there for decades. And also supporting all the conservation action that has been done in the place. They know very, very well their native fauna and flora. So the last year, they called Conamp and, uh, and us saying that they uh, thought they had seen a rat. Um, they do have an endemic their mouth, but they know very well what the difference. So they, they told us and we went together with CONAMP to, um, to check. So this is an example of a rapid response, something that is already in the place and you need to respond as quickly as possible. So we set up a grid uh, trapping. So we set up a, a series of traps and we took Merlina. We took Merlina uh, as a tool just to know if we were talking about already as a big infestation, an established population, or maybe uh, hopefully we were hoping for only one individual. And we were wondering, okay, Merlina is trained for rats and for house mice. So is she going to get distracted by the endemic uh, paramiscus? And at the end that didn't happen. She didn't uh, mind uh, of, of, of them at all. So she was very, very focused about it, her target species. So um, they check together with David Cosillo all the places, all the storages with a great collaboration for the, with, the, with the fishermen. And at the end, they, um, they got to the conclusion there was something only very like in a specific spot, nothing that was already an established population, but uh, well, we were hoping that it was only individual one individual, which in turn we confirm using the, the information from camera traps. But at the end, it was a big effort, a big investment. So we spent three months and a half in this place using several trap ties because we had the interference with endemic mouse, different baits, and a lot of trap nights and camera trap nights at the end, two people living per, um, permanently in the place for this time. And at the end, well, we, we caught this, uh, it was a main lot, it was a male, luckily, which probably we have had other history if we have had a, a pregnant uh, female. So just for finishing, uh, canine are a great tool for island biosecurity. They are great partners, this, the stocks that we have. And in Mexico, we're trying to work out strategic alliances between federal government, which we have already in place with CONAM a close collaboration to deploy all these biosecurity measures. But we're trying, as I said before, just for example, to move Merlina, to move it to other protected areas. Um, and also with Senasica, they have already trained some dogs for a specific purpose. So maybe we can have an interchange of these uh, units to, to, to move around places and different times. And also with other NGOs that are working in conservation on islands. And well, talking about the, the border where we are, we have um, a great collaboration going on with partners. As you can see here in the picture, it's a, it's a great team. Uh, through the biosecurity working group meetings organized by Julie Matos from National Park Service and Christy Bosser from TNC. And it's great because, because we have uh, all this um, information that we can share. And especially for, uh, for uh, Christy from the, the Nature Conservancy, they have used uh, Next, please. They have used uh, dogs for this specific purpose. They conducted, TNC conducted an Argentine ant eradication, which was a huge project in Santa Cruz Island. And they collaborated with Working Dogs for Conservation, an NGO dedicated for, to train a, um, canine units uh, to confirm the eradication. So they have uh, also this, um, this knowledge that we can share and also this same uh, NGO, Working Dogs for Conservation, have trained 
other uh, canine units to find emerald ash borders, invasive mussels, and dire uh, wood, as you can see in, in these images. For example, with the invasive mussels, they're a great problem, uh, zebra and quagga specifically, because they invade uh, whole lakes, they modify the whole ecosystems, and also they're a, a, a problem for people because they clog uh, pipes that actually uh, will interfere in the in the um, providing water for communities and for example with the emerald ash borders um, it it is estimated that they have killed around 50 million of trees only in the usa so it's a big big problem and you can actually you can have a sick or or a tree with the disease and not, not knowing it until it's too late and for the dyer's wood it creates just a full carpet which um, displays native vegetation. And well, there's also other uh, organizations in the States, for example, Midwest Conservation Dogs, and we have a, a dog train to, fi to find wild parsnip, and many other organizations, universities, at University of Washington, research institutes, etc. So many, many organizations dedicated to this uh, purpose to protect uh, the biodiversity. biodiversity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Luciana and Miriam. Um, I'm sure we have we have uh, questions that people want answered. I'm I'm curious myself. Um, the the problems that the rats cause on islands is it for for ground belt, uh, dwelling birds or what what impacts do they have on the flora and fauna? Miriam. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting my, uh, my microphone. Um, well, what we've seen, they, um, they're mostly problem from, for ground dwelling birds, as you said, but we also have um, documented that they eat reptiles, for example, um, and, and the eggs. And in, in Banco Chinchorro, which is a, a tropical, mangrove island, these rats were arboreal. So they would also get to birds that were nesting on, on the mangroves. And for example, uh, house mice in, in, I think it's Gough Island, are now um, attacking albatross chicks, which are, I mean, 20 times their size. So it's uh, incredible how um, harmful these rodents can be because um, native species don't have any defense mechanisms against them. Got it. Thank you. Yuta, right. do you have uh, do you have questions from the Q and A line that people would like asked? Yes, we do. Um, first of all, uh, there are a couple of questions regarding the health of the detection dogs. If you can explain a little um, about what is done, for instance, when um, if there's any protection for dogs going into very loud environments like the machinery, uh, the rooms, and a long term, just their, their care and maintenance. Yes, so, uh, well, it's, it's good to have if well, when, when Mauricio is with us, uh, he's a veterinarian, so he's uh, trained and all this, so he will take care of of the islands, but when when he's not, uh, David Cosillo is uh, trying to to learn the the most basic uh, things. And luckily, with Merlina, we have that uh, access to to uh, veterinary any any time. But yes, we're trying to be cautious, especially with the ships, as as you say. Yeah, this is a complicated. For example, the machinery room will be very yeah very loud at some point and very hot. But uh, since Merlina goes before the, the, the ship departs, everything is, is turned off. So it's, but it's still very, very hot. So it, she cannot stay there for long, long periods of time. She, and also she will need breaks. So if, so if it is a big room, she will check like a small section and then give a break and then another and then give a break. It's hard for her and also it's hard for the handler. So yeah, if we are talking about a big area, she will get, um, and her and any other detection dog or any other job dog that you have with a job needs to have breaks. 
and yeah yeah like and any signal that she she is not fine will just stop and then recurring to the the other devices and uh, yeah the watch blocks or, or traps mm -hmm. great so there are dog labor guidelines <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's good uh, another another question about how how long it takes to train a dog to identify a particular species. It, it will depend on on the method. I mean, each trainer has his own method, and and there's always new methods that we need to to learn. I I'm not trained it by myself, but I try to uh, to read as much as as I can of the subject. And for us, for at least uh, with Mauricio, it will take him uh, between. Uh, three or four months to to have a new smell that is changing because I know that he's learning from from uh, uh, another course that he he took training course am I saying that right uh, recently and and he said that he's going to take down that time but right now it's about yeah I will say about three months at least with the method that he's using mm -hmm. Surprisingly. But I, I think it's also important to say that they always have to continue um, training. It, it, it never stops, as, as Luciana mentioned. So if they don't work for a little while, maybe they're, they, they are not going to be as effective as, as usually. So you have to keep them um, training all the time. And yeah, you have to keep them uh, like, uh, yeah, just reinforcing about the smell and maybe trying with different concentrations and maybe once in a while where you're uh, getting only scats, but maybe use it urine once in a while and also keeping the dog motivated. So he needs to find, if we don't find something in a ship, which is great for us, we will uh, have a sample at hand and maybe put it at the end. So the Merlina will go and just like, oh, uh, I'll, I'll find something. And then the next time she will be more, she will be more motivated. Got it. We, we think about that with humans, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, just, just to uh, break in, we're almost at 1 o'clock. We'll continue to, um, to take questions and answer questions, but we want to be respectful of people's time. So if you need to uh, take off, it's the end of your lunch hour, please feel free. And um, if you have five minutes, fill out the survey you'll see at the end. Um, thanks very much. So yeah, Yuta. More, more questions. And please, please fill out the survey. That's very helpful for us. Yes, we had a question, which I'm sure you get frequently because you work in such beautiful areas. Um, whether are there any volunteer opportunities uh, for naturalists working on this program or, or maybe other programs as well on the islands? We don't really have like a volunteer uh, program, but we do, um, distribute or, or we, we do post on our social media whenever we have uh, new job opportunities. So we, we welcome everyone to check that out. And uh, we also do a lot of, of uh, work with, uh, for example, students who are maybe doing their uh, postgraduate degrees and they, we have uh, collaborations with them. So we are uh, open to that, but we are, uh, we, right now we don't have a volunteer program. I do want to just, I, I answered this and I typed this in, but I do want to mention that there are some volunteer programs in Southern California, up, uh, north of the border, um, with the Catalina Island Conservancy and with Channel mm -hmm. Islands National Park and probably with other national parks as well. Mm -hmm. right. It's uh, just in Mexico, we have a different system and we don't have it in place still, but hopefully in, in the future we will have this volunteer option. Yeah, yeah, but it's, yeah, the, the Channel Islands are awesome, awesome places. <laughs> they are, yeah. So a uh, question about um, how you are keeping the dogs. Are the dogs living with their trainers? Um, and then there was a, a connected question to that, which is, uh, are they, uh, what are you doing to protect some of your native um, species, and it may just be the level of training that you give the dog. Uh, well, I answered the first one. You got the second one? Mm -hmm. yeah? okay. Pretty separate questions, yeah. Um, yeah, well, the, no, the dogs are not, uh, right now the handlers that we have that are not Cosillo, so Cosillo's in charge of that. Uh, he's in, in, based in Ensenada and the dogs are in here. 
and we are we have some handlers that are from outside the state and they usually come and they they work with the same talk dog every time sometimes uh, once or twice the dog has gone with the with them to their houses but mostly they stay in Ensenada because right now we have a facility where they can uh, like uh, the the, um, the ¿cómo se dice jaulas? like their Ages? yeah their well, not their kennels thank you thank you the kennels and a, a big space to be working on and then have uh, to exercise and then uh, all set up of, of things that are uh, good for the training for hiding the samples and, and all that and which is something that the, these guys cannot in some cases they have other pets so they, they just live in a small place one of them lives nearby mexico city so is he doesn't have a enough space for for the dog so they if they haven't seen the dog for a while they come and beforehand or before starting working with the dog so getting to the islands with them to um kind of a reunion uh, re reunion and just also to help remotivate dogs and work with them prepare them for the islands so Yes, yeah, usually they're staying in Sanada and they work uh, specifically with David Cosillo to keep that training and then the, the handles will join. I think we would all love to have the dogs in our houses, but we, will, we would spoil them and then I guess they wouldn't be motivated to work. <laughs> um, on, the, on the second question, what are we doing? Um, well, just like uh, dogs are a, a very important tool for island uh, conservation and, and to protect the islands from invasive species, um, we have this uh, biosecurity program, which involves a lot of, of environmental learning with the local communities to implement uh, prevention, other types of prevention measures. And we also have, uh, well, the other uh, comprehensive restoration uh, programs um, that come after okay. removing um, invasive species, particularly mammals. So we also work on social attraction techniques for seabirds, uh, for example. This is where we um, we do a like a decoy colony so that seabirds, which are very um, gregarious, uh, think they get fooled into thinking there's uh, a colony on an island, so they come nest uh, in it. And, and that is a, a very uh, beautiful uh, project. And, and that's the, the slide I showed, that it has over 10 years, 80% of the uh, seabird colonies have been restored uh, through the implementation of, of social attraction techniques. And, um, then we also work on reforestation, which is another project that Luciana is, is leading. And uh, I think maybe some of you know Guadalupe Islands and it's getting um, more beautiful by the minute thanks to all the, the new trees that are growing in, on the islands. So those are some of the projects that we have. And if you would like to know more, you can visit our webpage. Um, it's, um, www.islas.org.mx. Um, and I did, um, I did send that website on, on the chat as well. So um, if anybody would like to, you can also Google. It's pretty easy. <laughs> <to find this. laughs> so thank you. Or you can send any, any questions that you, that you have to our email. So we'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And you have your email right there. And the, um, I was just going to say, it's also, there's a link um, to the organizational webpage on the Invasive Lunch 2020 page. Excellent. Question about how well, uh, whether the dogs can be used to identify pathogens, um, such as a peer phytophthora is a real concern, and it would be great to have a tool to mm -hmm. help search for that. Yeah, oh, well, I, I can send uh, some detailed information about that, uh, but I, I know that they have been uh, trained for, for that. I was just reading the other day about a paper uh, about the pathogens and citrus all affecting all the citrus industry in, in the States, and they were very, very effective, like um, around 90% or even uh, higher, or finding the pathogens on the trees, especially, well, there, was, there are some... Um, 
specific uh, places where they, they need to search, like specific parts of the trees, or it will depend on the, the advanced degree and the, and the tree, the, but they were very, very effective. And that was only an, this, it's only an example. So there are many, many examples. So I'm, I'm pretty sure that could be used for, for that. It's only, I think, is, is the matter of finding the, the, actually the characteristic smell that you want to uh, train uh, the dog for. And to, they've to also been used to um, detect fusarium, the fungus. Um, well, this <laughs> causes several diseases, but there's a fusarium that's spread by invasive shot hole borers that actually can be kind of detected by humans, too. It's a pretty distinct yes. smell. <laughs> <laughs> the smelling. As well, we just uh, got a, a message here on the chat that in the upcoming uh, Society for Ecological Restoration for California, uh, or in the, the one uh, symposium from last year, there was a presentation about dogs uh, being trained to detect Phytophthora. So I recommend. Great. The, if awesome, um, thank you. This very might much be it. an opportunity if Martha is still there and would like to unmute to just mention um, how dogs are being used in um, the state of California. Sure. Um, so I'm the Invasive Species Program Manager with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and we have working dogs primarily in our department with our enforcement that are, uh, it varies by the individual dogs, but some of them are dual trained for scent detection and apprehension, um, and some just scent detection. So those are primarily used for law enforcement purposes. Um, and we're also exploring in the department these biological type applications. So dogs working with scientists on a variety of um, types of questions and as another tool for our toolbox. So we're in a process of looking at what our internal department needs are to really assess whether it's something we can invest in because as uh, Miriam and Luciana explained, it is quite an investment. And so it's not like you can have a dog and keep them on the shelf and dust them off when you need them seasonally. Um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a year round ongoing investment and most, most of our biologists do a lot of different types of work. Um, so in addition, outside of our department, uh, county agriculture groups, either the counties or the state, use detection dogs in airports and at postage facilities. Um, and so they really are a great tool that can provide lots of benefits and in addition to that, I, I'll mention um, the um, NGOs and private trainers who train dogs in the state. So a, a tool and that if folks are interested, I see some really good questions coming up on kind of the practicality around the dog. So definitely ask those questions before you go too far into it. Uh, we're also looking at investing in them for the Nutria Eradication Project. Again, a great application, and that's large scale enough where we feel like it might be realistic to um, have a, a group of dogs that we can invest in the ongoing training and deal with the housing and the maintenance training. Great, thank you. Martha, that is super helpful. So their their dogs are extremely versatile. We also got another comment on the chat um, box that dogs are being used in Portugal to detect exotic tortoises in ponds. So lots of different examples. Uh, we have one last uh, last question here, and that is how many spe target species can a dog be trained on? Well, I don't have the exact answer right now, but uh, yeah, I would say I, I, I can check that to, to give you precise information, but ours have two or three the most, 
but uh, I can, yeah, that can totally end up. I mean, the thing is that you, you don't want the dog to, well, one of the things that usually the dog will mark only in one way. So you, you if, if you have many things in the same spot, maybe, yeah, the dog will be marking and they, you, you are not sure if, if, especially if you cannot see it, if it is the thing, but at least I will say, yeah, seven, eight smells, but I don't have the precise information, but I, I know who to ask. So I can send that information. If, if you send me your uh, contact information or leave it with the organizers, I can send that uh, info afterwards. If, if the uh, individual asking that question could uh, leave their, um, oh, actually I can get it here. Uh, we got it. So, uh, awesome. and you, you meant also that it's, oh, it's two or three at once or two or three in sequence? The, the training? Yes. Uh, it will be uh, in sequence, just to try to reinforce it, uh, the, the better, okay. just to make sure that it, it got it uh, one and then then the other. And well, at least the ones that we have been trained will be, we were using it for one thing and we thought maybe it's a good idea for it to detect this other species. And so it was in, in sequence. Okay. And I think that this is Martha again. I think that's an important consideration in your the dogs, what do you, how, how much specificity might your question warrant? So for example, in our enforcement canines, um, they are trained on animal parts, like bear gallbladders, I would say probably around 10 or so species. Um, again, I'm, I don't have expertise in it, but my, what I understand about our dogs is they're trained in specific animal parts that are um, kind of high commodity, you know, um, ones that we want to, to be able to detect if somebody has them. Um, so specific animal parts and then things like ammunition or drugs. So typically the dogs can detect. However, you can't differentiate in their alert what they are alerting on. So if they're inspecting a watercraft, for example, for quagga mussels, and they alert, they may be alerting on mussels, or they may be alerting on bear, bear, gar, uh, bear gallbladders. You're, and that is one of the important parts of the handler is then to take the second step and try to validate what that detection was on specifically. So and I think that gets real complicated in law enforcement where you, um, the reliability of their alert is very important. Um, mm -hmm. So if your, your research need or your management question is very specific, you would want a dog that had limited um, kind of detection capabilities. It makes them it makes their alert more reliable in a sense because they're only looking for one thing um, as opposed to uh, a diversity of things. Great. All right, that is all the questions we have. Thank you, Martha, for also um, sharing, uh, sharing some more of what's going on here um, north of the border. Thank you so much, Miriam and Luciana. It was a real pleasure and we, from our feedback, we got a uh, Great positive response to your talk. So. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Thanks, Martha. Thank you for inviting us and thanks, Martha. Great work. Great work. Thank you. Um, please do Thank fill you. out the survey. It will make the webinars as good as possible and help our organizations support us in doing more tomorrow or the rest of the week. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye.